if you asked a Christian or any person to describe God, one popular way that they might do it is to say, well, he's a God of love. And that's true. I mean, the Bible says it's true, so it has to be. <laughs> but I think, unfortunately, a lot of people have started to believe that that is God's only characteristic, that that phrase, God is love, is being used to characterize all of God as if he's one dimensional. And his love means that he approves of and endorses everything that his creation could involve themselves in. So. What do you do, like the other day when I was reading Psalm 5, what do you do when you run across a verse that says that God hates certain things and even hates certain types of people? So let me read this for you. Psalm 5, in the beginning of the chapter, David's talking about how he's worshiping God. And in verse 4, he says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and the deceitful man. All right, so here we see that God is a little bit more complex than just love, love all the time. There are certain things that he uh, dislikes. Evildoers, deceitful people, people who shed blood. And, you know, we really should expect this from God, though, because we certainly don't love everything. When people are wicked, when they do bad things to us, when they shed blood of innocent people, we don't say, oh, that's great, I love that, right? <laughs> and God is our creator. Uh, if we are that complex in our emotional scope, well, of course he's going to be as well. So what does it mean that God hates these people? This is kind of a challenge because didn't God send Jesus to die for all people so they could have salvation? Yeah, isn't there a verse in the Bible that says that God wants everyone to come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved? Yeah, so what does it mean that he hates people who do wickedness? Well, I think maybe it's best explained with an illustration. Imagine you have a mother and a daughter and the mother raises her daughter to be a good person, but when the daughter grows up, she goes off and gets involved in all these bad things, maybe criminal activity, these bad actions, and, and is maybe harming other people. And she says to her friend, I hate the person who my daughter has become. Well, what she's not saying is that she's withdrawing any opportunity for future forgiveness from her daughter. She's not saying, I hope the worst things happen to you. I hope you get what you deserve. I hope you run your life into the ground and uh, I'm never gonna be here for you ever again. And that's not, that's not it. What she's saying is that the kind of person who exhibits the characteristics that you are exhibiting is not a person that I like. That's not the direction that I want your life to go because that's a life of wickedness and it's opposed to the person who I raised you to be. And I think that's basically what David is expressing in, in Psalm 5. Does God withdraw forgiveness, the opportunity for forgiveness, when you do one evil thing, when you become a, an evildoer? Well, no, of course not. I mean, the Bible is full of examples of people who shed, shed innocent blood, deceived people, who lied to people and did any number of other wicked things, and uh, they become, you know, great heroes of faith. <laughs> so even David himself, you think about it, did he ever do anything wicked? Did, was he ever... Uh, uh, a shedder of innocent blood or bloodthirsty? Well, he killed a guy's, or sorry, he killed a lady's husband so that he could sleep with her. And God forgave him of that, right? So it's not, this isn't the, the kind of human hatred that we think of as being expressed here. It's that God hates the people who participate in these kinds of activities because they are in direct rebellion against him. Now, if they choose to live a different life and to repent and to find forgiveness in Christ, then that hatred dissipates. So now we know a little bit, not much, but a little bit about the nature of God and the emotions that he experiences. There are things that he loves and blesses and affirms, and there are things that he hates and that he doesn't want people involved in. So we need to take all of this into account, and we need to make sure that we aren't oversimplifying God to our eternal detriment. This is why it's important to read all of the scriptures instead of just a select few that sound nice and make God sound like he approves of everything. But that leaves us with a really important question for our application, and that is, well, how do I know what God loves and what God hates? Psalm 5, if you read the rest of it, David talks about how he respects God and he honors him, and therefore God has become a shield to him, his protector, his caregiver. On the other hand, he talks about how wicked people are going to be destroyed by God's fury and his anger because God can't tolerate that kind of wickedness. So we obviously want to be on the side of God and David, but how do we know how to get over there? Well, for some of you, that answer might be really obvious, but maybe to other people, it's not. How do we know the nature and the character of God? What introduces us to him? 
Well, it's the scriptures. That's where we go to look to see if our life is in alignment with God's will. And if he is going to be our shield when we meet him and our protector and our savior, or if his anger is going to fall on us because we've been doing things that he disapproves of. This will sound really elementary to some people, but I think it's a good illustration. Let's say that you're studying a language like I am now. I'm studying Albanian. Your teacher gives you this book. You go home, you open up the first two pages, read it, comprehend everything, do the practice exercises, and you say, aha, you know, now I understand Albanian. So you go back to your teacher and you tell your teacher, let me explain the Albanian language to you. <laughs> your, your teacher will look at you like you're crazy. Yeah, you may have understood a few things on the first couple pages, but obviously not the whole language. That takes time and study and dedication. Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who want to present a picture of God to you that's not comprehensive. Maybe they picked up the scriptures and they read one verse or two verses that tell us about one characteristic of God, but they're missing the big picture because they didn't read the rest of the book. Right? So whenever you are seeking information about God, obviously the best thing to do is to go to the book yourself and to begin the study. Is it going to take time? Yeah, right? but that's the only way that any of us can learn anything. Maybe the second best thing to do is to seek somebody out who has done comprehensive study of it, who can explain concepts to you from a place of wisdom and, and from a place of deep study. There's so many people out there who want to explain to you who God is, but they've never read the textbook. Are those the people that you want to listen to? Would you listen to me if I tried to explain Albanian to you right now? <laughs> you wouldn't. Common sense would tell you that was a bad idea. But use the same common sense when it comes to knowing God. So that's why I'd encourage you to begin your study today if you haven't and know him for yourself. And if you need help with that, I'm on that same pursuit, and that's really what this channel is about. There's Bible studies and notes on this channel and, and our website, tobelikechrist.com. All that's out there, and I hope maybe I can be some help to you in that, even though I don't have all the answers.